Uh, but I, I was in Indonesia on September 11th, and uh, when we got the news, and oh, that's a story for another time, we only, got, we only had partial information for a couple of days. We didn't know the extent of it. But I'll never forget, I was sitting in a group of surfers, you know, in Indonesia, and someone's like, and I said, well, it's, it's got to be, you know, it's probably, um, you know, the, some, one of the Islam, it's probably an Islamic terrorist, and somebody said, why, why would they attack us? And I said, well, because, likely because of the, you know, the, the situation with Israel and Palestine. And they're like, what's that? Mm -hmm. And I realized, oh, you know, we sort of walk around assuming everybody knows this. And so I'm going to do a little bit of a deep dive on the history, uh, you know, deep dive for as much as we can cover in an hour. Uh, but it does have, it will have, you know, graphics and we'll have a TV. So we'll have visuals too, yeah. <laughs> but meanwhile, uh, let's go back to something way more fun, in my opinion, which is uh, the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi about 2,000 years ago. And uh, I was going over my review notes yesterday. And uh, I got to tell you, I was struck again, at, um, especially as we wrap up this letter, it becomes clear uh, yet again how much uh, love there was. Um, you know, we love Paul because he's such a great theologian. He's such a great teacher, such a great explainer uh, of the doctrines of the faith. But it really comes out in this letter to his, his, his family at Philippi, how much he actually loves them, his concern for them, and the fellowship they enjoy together really comes out. So um, I, I, I thought I'd just, a couple of the major themes, uh, this came out in a study I just saw the other day, some teacher was saying something and I could totally relate. Every time, I feel like every time I, I do a deep dive in a book, God reveals a new theme and that it, that it jumps out in more importance. And I think when we normally think of the book of Philippians, we always think of joy. Joy is the most sort of known major theme. And sure enough, we saw a lot of joy. But I think what surprised me a little bit this time around was how much, he, um, how much precedence Paul gives the gospel and the importance of bringing the gospel. And it seemed like every element he told us about how we live our lives was so that we might promote the gospel, be unified, that you might share the gospel. Um, what's his name? Thea, what was his name? <laughs> I almost said Aphrodite, but that wasn't his name. Um, Theophilus, or what was, what it, was it? Theophilus was whispering. Yeah. How come I can't find it in my, um, the guy that was having an issue. Um, Oh, Epaphroditus. You guys, somebody say that? Yeah. Epapi. Epaphroditus. Oh, I said Aphroditus. That was close. Epaphroditus. Yeah. You know, and he talks about everything he went through and da-da-da. But man, he was there for the gospel. And he, and he served with me in the gospel. And I was really struck um, how much that came out. But also, we had a couple great teachings. Obviously, in the middle section, that we are saved by grace and grace alone. I mean, I love that Paul makes sure that has... Um, a high um, level of attention in the, in the letter, yeah. And even the concept of security in one of my favorite verses. In fact, I was at John N's his birth, uh, son's birthday party on Halloween last Tuesday when we weren't here. And I looked at, we were at the gym and I looked over and Karen, you all know Karen, Darren's wife, Karen, had um, one of her grandbabies up like this so the grandbaby could make a slam dunk in the, um, in the and I was like, that's the, that's the, you know, that's the thing. That's what we're talking about. When Paul says, not that I've obtained all this, but I reach out to grab a hold of that for which Christ Jesus grabbed a hold of me. To me, it's a beautiful picture of security that we reach out to grab a hold of what we have already been grabbed a hold of for. Does that make sense? Yeah. We're safe in the grip of Christ as we reach out for what he has for us. Okay. And then, um, we had a uh, long meditation. Meditation was a good pun on that. For um, whatever is good, last week, think on these things, yeah? And we just had a great conversation at the end of uh, last time about, or two weeks ago, I should say, yeah, about, you know, careful what you feed your brain. Because what you feed your brain is what you're feeding your soul, you know? And, and Paul says, think on these greater things, these greater concepts. Get, you know, he, he didn't say this, but get your mind out of the gutter, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, you know, and think on these things. And uh, okay, 
So uh, tonight we're going to actually have two very well-known verses uh, from the book of Philippians that are going to sound very familiar to you. Uh, but we'll take some time to unpack it. And we're going to wrap it up tonight just with some sayonoras from Paul. You know, greet, greet the brothers kind of stuff. Yeah, it's good, good fun stuff. So let's read uh, in Philippians chapter 4. Uh, let's start with verses 10 and 11. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you didn't have the opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And I know most of you know the rest of how it, you know, how it goes, but let's just stop right there. Let's take a minute. I love this when he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. I've lost track. We should have been counting all along. How many times does he use the word joy? How many? 13. Is this number 13 right here? Yeah, thank you, Mike, for counting that, yeah? You got that, got that natural. You're like Rain Man. Uh, thir Thirteen, yeah. <laughs> I say. No, but thank you. I, I appreciate that. So thirteenth, rejoice. Yeah. Um, and earlier on in this chapter, in verse four, he he tells the church to rejoice in the Lord. Yeah. And he began the whole letter thanking God for what He's done. And now at the end of the letter, he's rejoicing in his reliance on God for this. And um, it sounds interesting. He's not like, well, it's about time you remembered me. <laughs> it's, it's, at last, you've renewed. No, no. Um, they were apparently unable to help him uh, for some, un uh, um, some reason we don't know. But then he actually says, um, it's almost interesting. He says in verse 11, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, it, which almost sounds like, thanks for your help, but I didn't really need it. Right. But that's that's not actually what he's saying. Yeah, it would almost seem odd, you know. Um, but what I love about his rejoice, especially what we're going to find out in the context, what he's really rejoicing about is not like, oh, I rejoice greatly in the Lord because I finally got the bucks you sent me. It's what it sounds like. But that's not actually what he's what he's saying. What he's saying is I'm so happy because you get it like you get the whole program about giving of yourselves because this whole book of Philippians has been about the great joy and what I put in my notes and I think you'll understand this the great joy of getting your butt in gear to serve God like the joy of serving God the joy of being part of his congregation the part of the, the joy of of doing stuff in the kingdom ha having a role in the kingdom yeah the joy of letting God work through us, because remember, Paul makes it super clear through the whole book, we're not out to earn God's favor. Instead, he says we are working out our salvation, which is a great opportunity for me to repeat that lesson. We can only work out what God has already worked in. The gift of salvation, and then we work out our salvation and how we serve God, how we serve others, how we actively participate in the kingdom of God. We're not working for our salvation. We are working it out, okay? And Paul sees with great joy that they are getting it, yeah? Paul's like, I wasn't even in need. I'm just so stoked you're getting it. And then he adds, and you know, most of us are pretty familiar with this. I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. Oh boy, do I ever not have that dialed. <laughs> yeah now um the the greek in it is sort of interested he says i have learned um but it really comes from like i have been instructed yeah i have been instructed which makes me feel better because i feel like i am constantly under instruction from god to be content with not just having stuff or finances, but just in life, being content with, with everything, yeah? Now, it's interesting um, because the word, the Greek word for content almost seems, what's the word, uh, um, when it doesn't make sense, but... Um, incongruent. Yeah, incongruent, yeah. Non-intuitive, that's yeah, not a word, is it? Yeah, because it is autotarkis, which sort of means self-sufficient, right? But there's a catch, right? Because Paul's going to make it really clear that our self-sufficiency doesn't remotely come from our self, does it, right? 
So just so you know, um, the great philosophers of Paul's time were all about that, being self-sufficient to find sort of, you know, their own well-being in that. Um, that was like, are you familiar with the Stoics? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Stoics, you know? The Stoics, unaffected by either good or bad things. They were supposed to be Stoic, right? For lack of a better word. And so we hear this and we're like, wait a minute, Paul? Self-sufficient? Yeah, well, Paul's going to actually take that idea, right? And he's going to turn it and spin it on his head, uh, on its head, I should say. Um, but I, before we get to what he says, uh, I want to talk briefly about the idea of contentment as the world understands it, right? So the dictionary definition of contentment is satisfied with what one is or has not wanting more of anything else. And okay, that makes sense if, you know, content, I'm content with what I have. Um, what is, doesn't Sheryl Crow have a song, Steve? Um, it's not about getting what you want, it's about wanting what you have, right? Something yeah. like that, yeah? However, I would submit to you, before we learn that that's not what Paul's talking about here, just so you're aware, because we talked two weeks ago a lot about be careful what you feed your brain, Remember that every time you open a magazine, a newspaper, turn on the TV, the internet, or the radio, you are constantly being fed a diet of you need more. Because quite frankly, that is commercial advertising marketing 101. What is it? Create a need. My wife used to um, be part of the timeshare organization. She wasn't a timeshare salesman. She was what they call OPC. She'd sign people up to go. And that was basic timeshare sales. Create a need, you know, the classic. Um, do you like going on vacation? Oh, come on, really, really? Do you enjoy saving money? <laughs> All right. And here's how you do both those things combined, by to buy. Then why wouldn't you buy a week of timeshare, right? I say that a bunch of you are here right now because you own a week in timeshare. I get it, right? Yeah, you got so on. But you turn on the TV, how to be rich, how to be cool, how to have a cleaner house, how to have a happier spouse. Oh, that rhymed. That was really good. A cleaner house, a happier spouse, right? Yeah. Maybe there's a connection. Maybe, yeah, yeah. You know, how to feel, yeah, feel good. <laughs> We're not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole right there. I'll never forget, I wrote this in my notes because I wanted to share this story with you. Um, there was a period of time uh, before the internet where um, we didn't have TV. Tess and I, we did this thing when we first got married. We had no cable TV. Uh, we, we had a DVD player and you know, we'd rent series of DVDs or whatever. This is before Netflix. We'd buy DVDs, right? You know? Um, before, so before the internet, before um, uh, we, had, we didn't have TV. And I'll never forget, we went to go visit her family in Vegas. And um, they're one of those households where the first person awake in the morning turns the TV on and the last person to go to bed at night maybe turns it off. But the TV's on like all day, all day, right? And we would go over to go visit and I felt like I was stuck because they kept the, the, the curtains shut to keep the heat out with the AC on and the TV's on and it's loud and it was always what I call lowest common denominator TV like, you know, Montel Williams and Jerry Springer and, Whoa. you know, and after about an hour, I'd look at Tessie and she's like, I got to get Dane out of here because I'm like, ah, get me, I can't sit in a room with TV. But I'll never forget what I discovered. I'd never really noticed this before because I was sort of being force-fed TV. So we would go from their apartment where we watch TV, guess where? The mall. That's what kind of what they did, right, you know? And I'll never forget, I saw the connection, like so clearly of watching TV. You need this, 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 and then you go to the mall, guess what, there it all is. It was like all there, all the stuff that I was being told I needed. I'm like, ah, oh, you know, it's a profit market, right? Yeah. So this idea of people feeding you discontentment, does that make sense? Constantly. And then giving you the world's answer to that, that desire, right? Okay. Okay. So here we go. Let's go to verse 12. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. 
And I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or not. Wait, stop. <laughs> Don't look ahead. Because <laughs> you want to know what it is, right? Yeah. I just want to just point this out. He's showing it can be as difficult to be content with lots and with nothing. Isn't that fascinating? Right there in Scripture before your very eyes, the Word of God. You can be equally discontent when you have tons of stuff and when you have nothing. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah? By the way, the flip side of that coin is this. There is nothing wrong with striving and seeking to be productive and to wanting to do your job and doing well and to enjoy the fruits of your labor, right? But if you're not content with a little, it's doubtful you'll be content with a lot. Isn't that interesting, yeah? And I think we all know stories of people like who it was never enough or what have you, and they never were content no matter what they had, a little or a not. And I bet we all know people who had very little but seemed extremely content in their life, right? Um, my quick story on that, I might have shared this with you already. I, I, God kind of slapped me up the side of the head one time. Uh, I was complaining to God for weeks on end about how little money I had one time. I was like, oh, if I only had more money, oh, no, 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 this and that. And I might have told you this story 10 times already, sorry. But I'll never forget, I um, drove to work and all the way here I was complaining about, Lord, you know, if I only had some more money, how come, you know, da, 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 and then the credit cards are all maxed and I, da, 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 how am I going to get out of this mess that I created, you know, whatever, da, da, da. And I got here and I realized something, that when I had left my house that morning, I had one of four cars to choose from to drive here. <laughs> now, granted, the whole sum total worth of those four cars was only about 30 grand. I mean, you know, it wasn't like, you know, I had nice cars, but I had four cars to choose from. Three of my own and one car that we were storing for somebody that was, we, I was supposed to drive every once in a while to keep it going. Four cars to choose from. And what I remembered as I pulled up here, for some reason, God brought to mind our, our friend, um, Marky, um, Mark Anthony, the Filipino kid that we put through college. Remember our church? Mm -hmm. Who yeah. Tess and I went down there and visited him. Yeah. Great kid, uh, got a college education. He's working for a telecommunications company right now and probably will never own a car in his life. A car, right? Will never own a car in his life. And I had four to choose from. And God just kind of gave me that little bit of like, really? Tell me again how rough you have it, Dane. Um, you have so much food that you have a freezer in your garage to store the leftover food because your refrigerator is not big enough. You have a pantry, an entire room full of food and four cars. Really? Explain to me again, Dane, how needy you are. <laughs> I was so cut to the core on that. I was like, all right, all right, all right, all right. I give up, I give up, I give up. Okay, so um, Paul says, I have learned the secret. Before we get to what that secret is, real quick, the word mieo, which from where we get the word mystery, is really interesting because he says it is a learned secret. And the word learned is really interesting. It almost reads like initiated. I have been initiated into the secret. And the reason why I think that's interesting is because that word initiation is like something you've experienced. And so Paul is basically saying, I have learned through experience this great mystery. Does that make sense? Okay, I think it's a key point there. I've learned through experience, verse 13, when he says, this is what I've learned through experience. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Now, I say I can do all things. And so here's the thing. With this statement, anything through him who gives me strength, Paul turns the idea of self-sufficiency upside down and onto his head because it's not through his self at all. It is actually Christ in him. He shows that our only sufficiency, our only hope at contentment lies in the strength of Christ within us. Let me read you um, what he wrote about um, Galatians. In Gal Paul wrote this in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. So think about what that does to your, 
desires, your lack of contentment. Um, Steve has a saying about that. What is that about? Well, dead men, you know, really don't complain much or cause a fuss or have evaluation problems. Right. Dead men don't desire much, right? I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And I love this. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to read you now the, um, the NIV notes um, because they have an interesting spin on this that before, um, before we get to the next verse, I'm going to open it up for questions and comments. So this is a little food for thought. This is from the NIV Life Application Notes. Paul was content because he could see his life from God's point of view. He focused on what he was supposed to do, not what he felt he should have. Check this out. Often the desire for more or better possessions is really a longing to fill an empty place in a person's life. Paul had his priorities straight, and he was grateful for everything God had given him, given him and including, I would add, this is my addition to that, a fulfilling purpose and a mission on this earth, right? A reason to be here, right? I hate to quote what's his face, but a purpose-driven life, although I don't like the word purpose-driven, but how about a purposeful life driven by Christ in you, I think. Yeah, it would be a better way, it would be, I think a better way I'd rather put that, yeah? And by the way, I want to be careful about not making it not just that you could do stuff, because contentment isn't just in doing stuff. I'm a little um, suspicious of a statement that makes you go from having to doing as if doing is the answer, because I think we keep getting farther away, either having or doing. But um, I went to the Greek, the straight Greek translation on this, and I love the way it comes out. All things I am strong for in the who empowers me. And I underlined in the who. But if you read it straight verbatim from the Greek words, can I read that again? All things I am strong in the who empowers me, Christ. Isn't that kind of, that helped me a little bit. It's not just for doing stuff, but it's for everything. Does that make sense? Every situation, every feeling I'm having, every task I'm given, every accomplishment I do, every even need I have, all things, yeah? I am strong for in the who. I love that, for some reason that just really got me. In the who. Not because of the who, but in the who. We are in Christ, people, right? Yeah? Okay, am I belaboring the point? Keep moving, Dane, all right. So here's the thing. So we are not to be Christian Stoics, you know. Nothing bothers me. No, 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 no. That's what I love about the life of Christ as presented in the Gospels. You know, Jesus, he, he got sad. He got angry. He got frustrated, right? He loved greatly. He wept. He was a passionate man. He wasn't sort of a, I'm above the, you know? He wept when he saw his people suffering at the death of their brother Lazarus. Why? Because he had compassion for them. When he saw their her, he he had compassion for them and he and he wept. He was passionate, yeah? We're to be the same, not above and disaffected, but right here in the middle of it, and yet being content in him and all things. Deep down we know that he strengthens, and by the way. As Paul says, what did he say? I have learned to be content. Through experience, I have been initiated, right? Because we have not just heard it, that we also have been initiated into it. We have experienced his peace. We have seen his answered prayers. We have been shown by God how he takes care of us. And sometimes we don't see it until years later when we look back and go, oh, and by the way, that's really helpful for me to sometimes look back and go, you know, I didn't understand it at the time. I was really suffering, but now I see the fruit of that time that I went through now, which is helpful because I'll tell you the truth, there's other things I can look back on that I suffered and I don't see any fruit from. <laughs> and I don't know, maybe I just suffered for no reason. That's possible too, but I don't have to worry about it. Yes, Steve-O. Well, it occurs to me that in order to be content in every situation, you would also have to have a commensurate uh, 
appreciation for the providence of God. Yeah. You would have to sort of live your life as if to say, whatever is going on, I accept as from God's hand because I'm devoted to him and you know he can make things work. It's yes. not my dealio. Yeah, it's not it's my his deal. world. Right. I'm in his world. I'm in his hand. Yeah. I also think about um, like the Israelites in the desert and God goes before them, right? And he says, follow me. But he doesn't roadmap out exactly where they're going to go. He just says, what is Luigi always does that? Up here, up here, right? <laughs> Keep your eyes on me. Up here, look up here. Don't look over there. Don't try to look around look me. Emerson, me. Look at me. Yeah, look at me. Don't, don't look at her. Yeah, head. don't even try to look around me to see what's behind me. Just keep your eyes on me, yeah? By the way, that's easier said than done. I just want to confess that to you all, yeah? I think one time I might have told you this story I read about the guy that I met with, and he was so upset because he felt like God had showed him he was going to do something, and then that didn't happen. And he was really upset about that. And I said to him, I said, sorry, but I'm not aware of anywhere in the scripture where it tells us God is going to explain everything that's going to happen to us in our life. Quite the contrary, it seems more like the message I see from scripture is trust God with, in the moment with what you have. What does he say? Today has enough worries of its own, right? You know, stay close to him, stick, be in obedience and trust him for what's to come because life is unpredictable. And expecting God to tell you where you're going to be in 10 years is a recipe for disaster. What does James say? You think you're going to go here today, tomorrow, and da da the next day. You don't even know what tomorrow might bring, right? I, that was a really lousy interpretation of that verse. I get it. <laughs> Something about going to go do business here and there. Yeah, yeah. Say it, but say if the Lord will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if the Lord wills, we'll do this and that. Okay, that, that was good, Steve. Absolutely, and I sure hope so, because I feel like that a lot. So for my sake, I hope there is. But yes, I'm thinking of a scripture right now in my head where Paul says, though I long to be with Christ, right? Um, when he, when he, that's when he says, for, for me to die is gain, right? And yet it is better for you that I remain. Does that make sense? And so straight up, Paul is saying, like, God's not, like, my mission here is not done, though I yearn to be there. So, yeah, I, I would call that a holy, dis, I like that, I like the word, a holy discontentment is good. Yeah, this idea, um, you know, you might hear me, I say this a lot when I'm, um, when I'm preaching on Sunday mornings, and I, and I say it for the benefit of the unbelievers that are here. And that is because to me, it's proof of the fallenness of man. And that is just the fact that we do suffer because nobody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I hope I get sick today, right? Or I hope my car breaks or da -da. So why are we so upset? Why do we get so bummed when we wake up with a scratchy throat and we real, you know, you know that feeling when you know you're doomed like your spouse, you know, you know, your spouse has been horribly sick for 24 hours with phlegm and a fever. And then you wake up and you're like, oh, no, oh, no. And, you know, you're dead. You know, the next three days you're going to be super sick. Right. Now, my point is this. The reason why I think those things upset us is because we weren't created for this. Does that make sense? Yeah. We weren't created to suffer. We were created to walk in the garden in the cool of the day with God. And that's why we are discontent to be separate from God, right? Which is suffering on its own right there because the, he's the source of peace and life and, you know, all goodness and joy and all those things, right? And to suffer in this world. To me, and the reason I say that is because C.S. Lewis does a beautiful illustration about that. He says... I hunger because there is food. I thirst because there is water. He says, I desire God because there's a God. There's a God. Yeah, there's this want. This is why even unbelievers, when somebody dies, go, well, at least he's in a better place. Look how they hope for a better place, that that is sort of a universal desire, 
right? What, what, what do we say, what do unbelievers say about someone who's passed away? May they? Because we don't nat- naturally have it here. It's a great question, Dan, by the way. Is it a, I, I love the way you phrased it too. So I hope the camera caught it. Is it oh, is, can we leave room for some holy discontent? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I would say the answer is yes. However, we don't lose hope. We don't grow weary. We trust in him and we continue on. Because clearly, uh, Paul gets irritated too. Ask um, Mark James <laughs> and Barnabas. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear Barnabas go, yeah, how content were you when you, uh, <laughs> chewing on me. when you were chewing on me? Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yes, Garrett. Well, just back to the, the suffering part. Um, I learned a while back from Mike Wellman and um, it's when my eye, when I, oh, when, when you I, blew up? Yeah, yeah, I blew up my face and it, he's driving me around and I was, I was, I was bummed and you guys were taking me around to doctor's appointments and mm-hmm. this and that. But he said, when I went to a doctor's appointment and I was going to have some surgery later that week, he said, you know, he just spelled it out in Thessalonians, first Thessalonians four, but be joyous, pray continually mm-hmm. and be thanks in all circumstances. All circumstances. Give thanks. Is Christ's will, God's will for you. And it stuck with me and it carried that on through everything. And, and so it's good to suffer and you realize that, you know, this is where it's at and it's not, it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant, yeah. But, you know, that verse has always stuck with me, and it was, it was good, and, and, you know. Yeah, and Scripture teaches also that we share in the sufferings of Christ. Mm-hmm. And if you think of Christ's suffering, he wasn't a stoic either. He suffered. Yeah. He sweat blood. And yet, you know, what is it that saying? He set his face like flint, right? And yet, he never wavered. You know, he he set his face for Jerusalem, knowing fully well what was going to go there. He was strong. He had strength, which is the strength that we, yeah. Again, so we're not stoics about it, and we don't we don't slap a happy face on a horrible situation. That's not what he's talking about here. It's the strength to persevere through and even be content and say, "All right, this is what this is what God has for me right now." Yeah. It's all good stuff, yeah. All right, we should keep moving, yeah? Really good stuff. Okay, let's read verses 14 and 16. A little bit of a change of uh, direction here. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, I love the way he puts that, in your early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. So giving and receiving. Now, this is interesting. Paul is a missionary, but he was also a tent maker at the time, right? He supported himself, right? So he knows hard work, uh, much evidence that he often first tried to um, self-support his ministry, whatever, you know, whenever he had to. He could. However, he is also very much aware that there were times in ministry that there's real needs that demand the support of the larger body. And by the way, this is not a new idea at all. In fact, it goes all the way back to the book of Leviticus, when out of 12 tribes, Moses says, well, God says to Moses, I want you to take one tribe and they will be, and I love the word, set apart, right? Holy, set apart set apart to serve at the temple, to be a go-between between God and man. And you will bring your offerings and they will take some of that offering. I just was teaching the Anchor House guys this whole thing. You know, whenever we think of the sacrifices at the temple, let's be honest, I know I do anyways, 90% of the time we're thinking about sacrifice at the temple, we're thinking about the Day of Atonement where they take the lamb and they fry the whole thing, right? Then they take another lamb or a goat, they go interchangeable, and that becomes the scapegoat. They lay the sins on the head and they chase the scapegoat out in the desert. But did you know one of the most common ways to sacrifice at the temple was called the fellowship offering. And you know what the fellowship offering was? It was, it was yeah, it was a barbecue. It was a lamb barbecue. And you would show up at the temple with your family, like, right? And all your, you know, like a potluck, you'd bring all the fixins. 
and you'd show up and the priest would da 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 and he would ritually sacrifice the lamb or the goat or whatever you'd brought, you know, and then he would take the entrails and offer those up, right, you know, and the fat and offer that up. And then they'd barbecue, baby. <laughs> and everybody would eat. Everybody would sit down and eat. It's kind of cool, yeah? Anyway, so, um, so anyways, he had to have special people in charge to do that. So what he's saying is this. Um, the church at Philippi supported Paul's mission both to Thessalonica and Corinth. So this is what happens. Um, MacArthur, um, MacArthur is the one that showed uh, that I read about this. Um, he showed how um, Philippi was so excited about Paul's teaching of the gospel that they supported his efforts in Corinth. So if you read in the book of Acts, this is chapter 18, verse 5. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia. Now look what, do the connection on this. What does he say here in... Um, yeah, right here in verse 15, he says, when I left Macedonia, right? So now we pick it up in the book of Acts, yeah? When Paul and Silas came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. How could he devote himself completely? He didn't have to make tents. He had been set aside, no need to make tents. We just want you to study the word, teach the word, and preach the word, right? I can totally relate to this. I know Tom can too, because been there, done that. I was a tent maker for, I don't know, seven, eight years, almost 10 years altogether. Um, I don't know if you all know the stories, but um, I used to um, park cars at the Marriott, and I told my boss on Sundays I could never work before 1 p.m. because I had church in the morning. So even when I moved up the seniority level, I, I wouldn't show up earlier, which is how it works. I'll spare the detail. Cheese members that. Yeah, Mike, Mike worked with me. And this happened more than a few times. I'd preach the Sunday morning service and then bolt straight to the Marriott, take my shower, shave, get into my uniform. And I'd go upstairs and people would be, you know, pulling up in their rental cars and you could see the little, remember the little Marriott tag they'd hang on the uh, rear view mirror, which is how you always knew to say, hey, welcome back. Get it? Because you knew they were a guest because I don't know. And I can't tell you how many times I'd open there, hey, welcome back. And the people would come and go, didn't you just preach the sermon this morning? Because <laughs> people would go to church and then they'd go to brunch or they'd go to the Poi Poo, whatever. They'd go spend the day at the beach. And when they come back to Marriott, there was the preacher going, hey, well, welcome back. <laughs> Um, so here's the thing. Um, I was being, you might say, generous with my time, right? You know, because I was doing 20 to 40 hours a week ministry out of my own time, right? Basically. However, Paul says, those of you who are generous with your finances enable me to not have to park cars, Okay, so thank you, number one, thank you. So many of you, all of you really basically support my salary so I can basically do what I'm doing right here and right now. And I think I've told you the story too many times, so I'll move on from that. But I went around all the elders when I came full time and said, what do you expect me to do? And the answer was really universal, except from Tom. Tom said, <laughs> forget it, Dane, or, you know, whatever, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I went to you, I went to your house, Tom. I don't know if you remember this. I think you lived in Welly Welly Track at the time, yeah? What do you expect? And I'll never forget, it was really universal. We just want you to not have to park cars. And just, you know, I remember Doug Wilhelm saying, don't even do more of what you're doing. Just keep doing what you're doing, which, of course, yeah, right. You know, I, just, <laughs> I filled up that extra 40 hours really quick, Yeah. But we just want you to do what you're doing and not have to make tents. And when I read this verse from Galatians, Paul says, thank you so much because I could devote myself to the teaching and the preaching of the gospel, right? Okay, now he gets to their benefit in doing this, the fruit of the giver for the, for the giver, verses 17 and 18. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for, I love this, but I'm looking for what may be credited 
to your account. Oh, I love that, yeah? I've received full payment and even more. I'm amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. And check out what he says. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. Let's just stop right there because that was some pretty deep stuff he's saying. Paul, Paul is clearly not excited about the money, right? It almost sounds like he says, thanks, but I didn't really need it. But that's not what he's saying. He's going, hey, no, it's not about like what you gave me, although I'm blessed, right? But he's excited about what spiritual blessings God is doing in their lives. Um, the Greek is credited to your account. It means you are accruing interest. <laughs> you are increasing your abundance in your giving. And he knows that they are growing spiritually in their level of trust and their faith in God, thus in their level of joy. And he's so stoked, yeah? In other words, they're not just, you know, you know that store your treasures in heaven. It's not just simply investing for the future, but they're enjoying the fruits of the benefits in their giving now, being part of what God is doing by investing from their finances, yeah? Not just gaining some heavenly gold for some future thing, but enjoying the fruits of their time now. This is what MacArthur says about this. Their gift brought Paul joy, not because of its personal material benefit to him, but because of its spiritual benefit to them. Did you catch that? I almost want to read that again. Their gift brought Paul joy, not because of its personal material benefit to him, but because of its spiritual benefit to them. He saw their spiritual growth in their giving, and he knew that they were growing and they were maturing. He knew that when he, all these talk about joy, in the book of Philippians, they were reaping a harvest of that because he saw the fruit of it. And when he uses that word, fragrant offering, I, I want you to know he doesn't take it lightly to use that term. And here's why. These are the same words in the New Testament. The only other time that word is used in the New Testament is to refer to the sacrifice of Christ. Your Fragrant offering is used in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, when Paul says, Walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. And what he's, what he's doing by comparing those two things is the idea that it's not just money, it is your sacrifice. It is your offering as if you were going to the temple, right? Only the deal is it's been paid for already. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse two, this is your spiritual act of worship. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And Jen would probably say, Dane, there's no period there. Um, <laughs> but verse 19, in fact, let's just read it as one big shot. So Jen doesn't have to for us. Thank you. He says, I am amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. God will meet your needs. Isn't it awesome that God doesn't say, uh, that Paul doesn't say, God will meet all your wants? Oh my gosh. Thank God he doesn't meet all my wants. Because <laughs> if you know the things I've wanted in my life, what a disaster that would be, yeah? But needs, yeah? By the way, so I had to do a deep dive on needs to make sure it wasn't wants. It's not wants. Praise God for that. Literally in the Greek, this, the, the exact iteration is what is necessary for you, you know? And, um, in his, and in his letter to Corinth, he, he, it's the same word he uses, it's necessary for you to serve. So check this out, the same word in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. God is able to bless you abundantly, look at the connection to the Philippians verse, so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, same word, you will abound in every good work. 
Now, if you do the math and all that, God says, my God will supply all your needs to serve. In the context of what you give. Are you doing the math on this? He's saying, you continue to give, I will continue to supply you so you can continue to give. What is that old saying? You can't outgive God? Because as soon as you give, he's ready to give you some more. <laughs> I remember one time Tessie said, oh, don't you wish we had all that bucks to give away to people? And I said, well, I think God gives people who, get, who give. <laughs> Maybe we ought to give more. She goes, we can't afford to give more. I go, well, <laughs> you want to test that? Because <laughs> if you give, God will give, right? You can't outgive him. You can't, yeah? Um, okay. Any thoughts on that before we wrap so up? the widow got more because she gave her two mites? She probably did. Yeah. All we know is this. She gave, she was content, right? She trusted God, yeah? And maybe God didn't give her what she wanted, but he gave her what she needed. He gave her what she needed to give more, right? According to these verses. I think that's the logic on this, Yeah. I was just thinking, have you ever like got that first big scratch on your new car or whatever? And you go, <gasps> yeah, whatever. It's just stuff, right? You know, and, and that or like in a, if you're a surfer, the first ding on your brand new surfboard and you're like, but I, uh, you know what? It's just a board, right? And then suddenly it drops a notch and it's not the idle. Maybe did you get a ding on your new board? Me? No, Jen. Jen's back there with a big sour look on her face. I broke she... Oh, you broke. <laughs> uh, fin, fin box, yeah. You broke the fin. Oh, in the box. Ooh, that is horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I got a worse story. <laughs> Bought a brand new board, and before I wrote it, a guy asked me at the beach if he could take it out, and he broke it in half. <laughs> before you wrote it. Before I ever wrote it. Brand new board. Wow, Tom, that it really is. And that, you know, Tom's the guy who got baptized in the ocean and when they pulled him up out of the water, he got hit by a surfboard. It's been going on my whole life. <laughs> I don't think you should surf, Tom. By the way, I'm with Doc. Can we just have a couple of our wands? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah. I think I'll tell you the story before the day we moved into my new house, my brand new house. And yeah, and while we were having the celebratory move-in pizza, um, my friend Maddie Drake's kid was pushing Cozy in the laundry basket and had a piece of sand stuck to the bottom. And I just hear this. <laughs> and I'm like, stop! And my brand new wood, um, what, chair, what was it? Um, tiger wood floor had this huge gouge right across the middle of the floor. And I remember just going, you know, it's not a museum. <laughs> right? Like, pew, that big idol of my house went, pew. In fact, we should wrap up. We've got 10 minutes left to finish the book of Philippians. I want to just show you one last really cool thing. Um, it, verse 20, of course, ends with a great word of praise. To our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Um, amen. How fitting to end this book with just a word of praise. Yeah, because in reality, we have been given so much. The book is all about all the great things God has done for us, how blessed we are, the abundance of the spiritual abundance in which we walk in, yeah? And then I just love this little bit where this, for some reason, I mentioned at the beginning of the study how much the love Paul has for this church and how much you feel, you sense the love for them. And I just, it really spoke to me in these last couple of verses. Verse 21, greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings, and all the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Can we just stop there for a second? What a cool little thing for him to say. Just drop a little, oh, by the way, and all the saints in Caesar's house. He's boasting about the gospel. The gospel's going into Caesar's very household, yeah? Now, a quick word, because you might not know this in case you didn't know this. How come it says all the saints? Does that mean St. Jude, St. John? St. No, just so you all know. And I assume most of you know this already. Saint is just a different word for believer. Um, but by the way, there's something interesting about that. Um, the word for saint is actually translated from hagios, which is where we get the word holy. Holy always means set apart, right? 
we are quite literally the set apart ones, yeah? Now, the reason I thought that was different is because to me, that's what makes Christianity a little bit different, maybe a lot different than many other religions or philosophies or even belief systems. And that is what we believe. We don't, um, we, we don't like practice Christianity as a philosophy, as like a way of better living or a way of life. What we believe is that we have, as we spoke about earlier, been crucified to ourselves, died, and we live our lives in Christ Jesus, even as he lives. We have become one with him. We are in him. And because we are in Christ, that sets us apart from those who are not in Christ. So it's not like, oh, we just have a different way of living than you have, and oh, he has a different way, and he has a different way. We quite literally are not part of that world anymore. We have become part of God's kingdom. Yeah, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Way different than just sort of a different belief system or a thought process or a philosophy of living. But I think what we really all enjoyed was this idea of the saints in Caesar's house, yeah? It's a fantastic little teaser into what's really been going on in Rome. Um, I kind of envisioned it this morning when I was reading it. You know, this was a letter that they read out loud in the church at Philippi. And I wonder when they got to that part of the thing, you know, and especially those who belong in Caesar's household, if somebody went, wait, what? Wait, read that again, what? Oh yeah, oh yeah, it says right here, believers in the royal household of Caesar. Now, we don't know what that means. Could have been servants, slaves. We know for sure in the barracks and in the military and at the highest levels of the military. Um, but I just love that little, oh, by the way, the gospel is going into Caesar's house. And it just reminded me of a, um, a story. I got to do that to somebody once. It was more like self-interested in that way. But um, when I had been living in South Africa in 1991 and a few different people had been sharing Christ with me down there and then I'd got saved and then I'd sent a letter to my one friend and he had, that, that letter had been read to the church, which is kind of cool. How, I mean, how biblical does that sound? I wrote a letter to my buddy thanking him for sharing Christ with me to tell him that I'd become a believer and that I was even playing in the worship band. Unbeknownst to me, they read the letter to the whole congregation so that when I showed up a year later, they're like, oh, you're the American. And I didn't know. And they're like, I didn't go, oh yeah, we read your letter, oh yeah. But, but there was another buddy of mine, a guy by the name of Des Sawyer, who's a surfboard shaper down there. And um, like my first or second day, I'm back down in South Africa, I'm out surfing and Des is paddling by me. And I go, hey Des, and he paddles, hey, bro, how's it going? All right, you're around. You're going to be around all winter? I go, yeah, just by second day. I'll be here all winter. And he said, great, man. It's great, great sin. You should, you should, I'll never forget what he said. This is what he said. He said, you should come around for some soup sometime. <laughs> soup. Just for some reason, I never forgot that. Come around for some soup sometime. And I said, yeah, it'd be great to um, come by and, and, and fellowship. And I'll never forget. Test took two strokes. One, two, and went, what? <laughs> and he looked at me and I go, yeah, bro, I got saved. And then he turns around and comes back. Ah, brother, yeah, you can't, yeah, 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 no, you, gotta, you must come for dinner now. You got to come for dinner, yeah. Yeah, it was great. It was really, really great. That, but I, that, when, when Paul says that, that's what I thought of. By the way, the saints in Caesar's household. Yeah, you know, the, the kingdom is on the move. But I'll, I'll wrap up with this thought. Note the, what's that? What about the soldier he was chained to? Oh, yeah. oh. You, you think yeah. he turned to him and said, yeah, say, say hi for me too. Yeah, <laughs> I know. yeah, yeah. Claudius, yeah. <laughs> rattling my chain as we speak, says hello, yeah. <laughs> you want to say anything? Paul's like, you got anything? <laughs> Anyways, I just want to wrap up with this last idea. Um, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, amen. I was just really struck today reading it again. Note the warmth at the end of the letter from a guy who used to be such a legalistic nightmare, for lack of a better term. Let us not forget as we read the warmth and the love pouring forth from this letter, his great concern for them, his great admonishment not that they might be legalistically righteous, but that they would fully embrace 
um, the love and warmth of Christ and the contentment of Christ and the great joy of, of living out the Christ-like life, yeah? And, and say hi to my brothers, yeah? And remember who he used to be on the road to Damascus, breathing out murderous threats, imprisoning even to the, unto the point of death believers. And remember what he even said about himself in chapter 3, you know, legalistic, Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee from the tribe of Benjamin, as for zeal, persecuting the church, righteousness, or legalistic, that's righteousness, faultless. And now look who he's become. Look at the, the, the movement in Paul's life. He's a changed guy. He's a changed guy, yeah? It's a total shift for him, yeah? And uh, this is for all of us, yeah? In that process of shifting from who we were to allow the life of Christ through us and change us and shape us, be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And um, that word we learned tonight to... Um, to learn through initiation, through experience of attempting to live out the Christ-like life and, and be changed from it, yeah, and, and through it. Okay, that's the book of Philippians. Unless anybody has a question or a comment, um, we can wrap up with that, yeah? Well, let's just wrap up. <laughs> okay, and then remember, we're off. Yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. We're off next week. Don't come next week, but come back on the 21st, okay? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for... Um, Lord, I just want to pause right now, and I want to thank you for the life of your servant, Paul. Um, Lord, because you do all kinds of miracles. You did all kinds of miracles when you were walking around, and you did things like you know feed the masses with a couple loaves and turning water to wine, Lord. But Lord, the greatest miracle is, is changed lives when, when people who were one way um, become something completely different. And you, you are the God who calls things that are, that are not as though they are. And then you live that life out through people and you change people and you, um, you create more loving, joyous, um, content people. And so Father, in the light of everything we've studied over the last 13 weeks now, um, Lord, we invite you to take all these words, um, your living word, uh, invest your living word deeply into our souls that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds, God. And in doing so, we will know what your good and perfect will is. And I would even add, Lord, you would give us the courage and the faith to live out that will for us, that we, like Paul, would become changed and different people, Lord, um, more in into living out your life to give you glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, you guys. Yeah. And by the way, no idea what we're going to do in January. No idea. When were you thinking of doing that mid mid-east update thing? Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. November 21st. Right. November 21st.